This episode originally aired as a part of my other podcast, Project Shadow. Over there, I have been doing world-building content for a while, and I'm currently moving it all over to this new podcast. New episodes will be appearing soon. I am currently making all of my old content, including World Building 101 and World Building 201, available on this podcast as Season 1 and Season 2 of Myth Weaving. I hope you enjoy, and don't forget to have the fun. Now that all the dogs have decided to start barking in the neighborhood and nothing that I do makes them go away, hopefully you can't hear them, let's continue our discussion, shall we, on world building. We've talked about building all of the elements except for one, and that's the passage, the cycle of events that take place in our world. Remember, we are building a world, not a a book or a novel quite yet. All right? So let's talk about the steps on the passage on today's episode of Project Shadow. Hello everyone, how are you doing today? My name is C.E. Dorset. you might know me <laughs> as the podcaster, Charlie. I said that backwards today. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get through this episode. I am going to get through this episode. Come hell or high water, I'm going to get through this episode. Okay, so just some things. If I sound flustered, it's because I've been trying to record this all day, and today is the day that... I, I, I want to say cabin fever has started getting to my neighbors, but we're still not in a, uh, there's not a st- shelter in place order for our state yet. And most non-essential businesses are closed. So a lot of people are home and all the kids are home. And today was the day where just everything decided to go crazy. I had one neighbor burning what I'm hoping was plastic in their backyard today because it smelled like plastic. I don't know if you can hear that. Somebody got themselves a new motorcycle and are doing things with that. All of the dogs are barking in the street. There's been mowing and there's this, this just every time I sit down to record, like I wait and everything's quiet. I'm like, okay, now's the time. And then all the crazy sounds just like immediately start back up again. And it's been this cat and mouse game that I've been playing all day. And on top of it, my cats are chasing a fly that got into the house. And I haven't caught it yet, but they've knocked just about everything over that they could possibly knock over in their attempts to get the fly. It's been insanity. And I'm alone. (laughs) I'm sitting alone in this house, and it's just been crazy all day. Alrighty, so... I apologize for sounding flustered. I just thought I should give you a little bit of backstory for my life so you understand why I sound like this. Everything is fine. My nerves, on the other hand, are so frayed, I don't think they're load-bearing anymore. So, yay. (laughs) We shall get through. We shall get through. Alrighty, so back to world building. Let's just, just, let's just go. Okay, so we've built our model. And that's what we're going to be referring to everything that we've done up until this point. It is the model. We've started assigning archetypes. We have st- we have drawn a circle around the entity being transformed. We know the scourge, the cause of the problem, the holdfast. We know the hero, the marvelous element. We know all of the things that are going to get us here, there, and yonder. Now, this is one of those points where I can't stress this enough, If you really want to follow this method to the T, you need to get yourself a copy of John Bonnet, Bonnet, I don't know, B-O-N-N-E-T, his book, Stealing Fire from the Gods, because I'm going to do a brief overview today of the steps of the passage, and Monday, I'm going to talk about the story focus. There's a lot of detail I am not going to be able to cover in in, in this podcast series, mainly because 
We have so much we haven't even gotten to yet. We haven't talked about building civilizations or building cultures or building mythologies yet. Yeah, there's more. So 201 is going to be starting next week because I'm just going to go right into it because y'all seem to be enjoying this. So let's talk about the steps of the passage. The easiest way to conceive of this is that the steps of the passage are the hero's journey, except slightly modified. And they've been modified in two very important ways. One, they've been broken up into kind of epochs and eras where major events will happen that will cause change that will then cause the next stage to happen. And half of this has been modified to basically be the creation of the holdfast. So what we're actually creating here is the history of the world, not the history of our book. Because our book, when we talk about story focus, will take a portion of of this story that we're coming up with. And remember, you don't have to get everything. You don't have to get everything. The whole purpose of this process is to be iterative. Get what you can get this pass through, then build on it and build on it and build on it until you have the world that you're looking for. All right? So we're going to start on the downside of the passage. This is how everything went from a kind of okay place to the state of misfortune. And then we're going to do the upside of the passage, which is how things go from the state of misfortune to the marvelous element, and then back again. And you can repeat this cycle as many times as you need. You could use this for each of the major wars in your setting. You could use this for the rise and fall of great civilizations in your setting. You can use this method for a lot of things. It works very, very, very well. So, in the downside of the passage, everything is broken up into three major, I'm going to call them apochs. Why? Because I like saying apochs, because that's not how you pronounce it, and I like pronouncing it that way anyway. So, that's how I'm going to say it. And they're very big picture moments. So, on the downside, we have how the hero becomes the holdfast, how the anti-hero regresses, how the anti-hero becomes a tyrant, and how the anti-hero is rewarded. On the upside of the passage, we have four major epochs again. We have how the hero gets involved in the passage. We have how the hero is initiated, how the hero is humbled, and how the hero is rewarded. And back and forth and back and forth and back and forth we go. Okay? Now, most of these st steps are essentially the same, though they are reversed. So, when we're talking about how our holdfast, how our hero becomes a holdfast, instead of a call to action, we have a fall from grace. We have the various commitments that they have to make, their plans and preparations, all of those early elements are all in here. Because our, remember, unless you're writing for a very young audience, your villain doesn't see themselves as a villain. This is, in all world building, probably the most important step. And it's the one that always gets skipped. It's the one that always gets skipped. Because it's easier just to go, my dark lord is a dark lord. What, what more do I need to know? You know? Voldemort had a bad childhood, but that still doesn't explain how he became the Dark Lord. Harry had a bad childhood. He didn't become the Dark Lord. And we can tease out the differences, but let's be honest, Rowling didn't. Th that wasn't the primary concern for her. One person is selfish, the other person is selfless. That inherent identity which is a thing that she ardently believes in, unfortunately, is what makes the difference between Voldemort and Harry. And even with all of Dumbledore's protestations that, with love, Voldemort could have been saved, let's be honest. According to her personal philosophy, a person is who they are born to be, 
And that's all they can ever be in life. Not that I'm bitter. <sighs> so you need to think about your fall from grace. You need to think about what it is that they think they're doing that is good. And a lot of people are going to get really mad at me for this. A lot of people are, because anytime I mention the prequels, ooh, people get unhappy. But watching the fall of Anakin Skywalker really shows this. He doesn't become a dark lord because, ooh, evil's fun. He desperately wants to save his wife and child. He's so desperate that he will do anything, anything, including give himself over to the dark side. He has a reason. That's how he falls from grace. Yeah, he has anger management issues. Yeah, he's got a bit of a dark side himself that prepare him for that. But all in all, he has a reason. Palpatine, we don't know. He might have a reason. He might not have a reason. He finally has first name and it's Sheev and okay, that's fine. <laughs> but we don't know his reason. And see, the thing is, even if we did, then we'd have to start asking about Darth Plagueis. What was his reason? What made him fall from grace? And this is where you can do this endlessly back and endlessly forward. You can, you can just keep repeating this cycle over and over and over again, but don't try to focus as closely as you can to what will be most important to the narrative you're wanting to tell. But you need to figure this all out because it, even if it doesn't show up in your story proper, it will inform the actions your characters take and make their actions more believable. Okay, so now that we have talked about how they are initiated, in the second phase, how the anti-hero regresses, this is where they first face reality. They've, something challenges them. And this is true for our hero and for our anti-hero. Something challenges them. They, for the first time, have to face the world as it is. If you're using the classic hero's journey that Joseph Campbell came up with, this is crossing the first threshold. This doesn't happen until phase two. Everything prior to that is phase one. It's what sets the character up to either fall from grace or rise as a hero. So everything up to that point, phase one. Okay? Phase two starts right here at the crossing of the threshold. Something happens where they have to face reality. They are tempted. They are tried. Our hero doesn't always completely succeed in all of their trials. They don't, but, and this is very important, they don't completely fall in their trials. Our anti-hero might actually succeed in their trials, but never quite completely. There's always something there that taints it or that prevents it from being a perfectly clean victory thus continuing them on their path, either down or up, depending on the side of the cycle that they're on. This side of the hero's journey will take us from the crossing the first threshold all the way through to the final battle, all the way through. So everything that happens in there happens here. Okay. And then it kind of sort of half repeats. And this is the thing that gets changed in the stealing fire from the gods method. When we get into part three, which is how the anti-hero becomes the tyrant or how the hero is humbled. This is actually the midpoint. Our hero has met the goddess. Our hero has gone through everything that they need to go through, but something happens and everything comes flooding back. All the bad stuff start, starts rising again. This, and by bad stuff, I mean whatever it is that is going to thwart their plans. Whatever it is that's going to prevent them from completing their masterwork of either becoming our new Dark Lord, our new 
hold fast or becoming our new hero. And in this stage, we have the hero or the anti-hero have to face the state of misfortune, either creating it or destroying it. See, they've already assimilated the powers. This is actually the beginning of the return, if you're using your Joseph Campbell version of the model. They're trying to come back. This is the return threshold. But now they have to face the actual problem, the state of misfortune, and either bring it on or destroy it. And this phase ends with their symbolic death, whatever that may be. Phase four, for the anti-hero, this is how the anti-hero is rewarded. For our hero, this is how the hero is rewarded. This is those final few moments that we see in the hero's circle, her hero's journey. This is the return. This is the mystical marriage. This is the rebirth. This is the ultimate boon, as Joseph Campbell called it. This is the moment where everything is healed, restored, and made better, or everything is corrupted, broken, and brought down, depending on which side of the cycle you're telling at the time. Now, I know I went through that really, really fast. I, I know, and I'm sorry, but don't worry. We're going to go through the hero cycle in a lot of detail in a future episode. The main gist of what I'm trying to get you to understand now is for simplicity's sake, because we're still in this early stage where we're fleshing out our idea. We're slowly bringing our idea about. So all we need is the basics. So take your hero's cycle, which you can easily find online, your hero's journey, put it on both sides. And remember, every time for the anti-hero, everything that should make them better makes them worse. And the hero cycle goes as normal. And this is both sides of our history. That's all you need to know at this point. And rinse and repeat as much as you need to do to tell your story. Maybe there was a previous golden age that fell prior to the one that you're dealing with, and you want to chronicle that so you know the names of some of the major cities or some of the legendary figures from back then. This is the method that you will use to create them as well. These are the heroes and the villains. These are the big pieces that exist outside your main story. This is how you determine their tale. Once you actually have this, we're going to start looking at, next time, the story focus. That's where your actual book, your short story, your novel, your novelette, your novella, whatever it is that you're writing, your screenplay, your stage play, that's where your actual novel will take place. And it could span large chunks of this wheel. If so, then you have a better idea of that portion of your story. But if you remember, I was very, very clear, and I'm trying to make sure that everyone is staying on the same page here. We're still talking in the biggest, grandest of pictures here. So in our Star Wars example, which we keep going back to, this cycle of rise and fall, rise and fall, for us, would be the rise of the Jedi and the rise of the Sith. And how one leads to the waxing of one leads to the waning of others and vice versa. This is the main conflict of the Star Wars universe as it currently exists. And so that is the cycle that we would be concerned about. Then we would go in and put our dots. So the nine dots of the Skywalker saga would then take place three on the fall side, and then the other six on the rise? Wrong. Then we would have three on the rise, and then we have a new cycle get started, and we kind of skip all the way down to the bottom. We skip, because there's that big gap between it the return of the Jedi, and the Force Awakens. That's where that fall happens. That's where we figure out Snoke and the First Order and all of that. That all happens in that gap period. 
The Force Awakens is actually the first dot in our hero cycle going back up. And if you want to know why those movies had a lot of issues with them, when they were doing their world building, they didn't build the fall for that second cycle. And so they didn't have answers for the rising cycle. And it ended the way that it did. (laughs) I mean, you can really see it in the world building here. And the main problem with those is not even that they had different writers, that they had different directors, different visions being brought in on each film. The problem is in the world building, that they didn't take the time to understand their cycles and the major events that took place in them. Who are the Knights of Ren? Who is Snoke? They didn't have firm answers to those. They didn't have a good reason for him to stay alive. And thus, we ended up with the story that we got. So do your homework so you don't make a Rise of Skywalker. (laughs) That's the moral of the story. But also do your work so you don't end up with the Suicide Squad. Because if they would have done this kind of work with that, or with any of the DCEU movies prior to Justice League, all of this would have been much better. Because they, they would have had reasons for things. Whether we had seen it or not, they would have made the movies make more sense. All right. I know that was a bit of a crash course and a bit of a cheek. I promise we will go through the hero cycle in more detail in the future. I just I want this to be a brief in- introductory series. And then when we start our 201 and the rest, we can really dig into the nitty, the nitty nitty gritty. Okay. All right. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions or comments or topics you'd like to hear discussed on the show, and please don't say the hero cycle again. I promise I am. I am getting to it. I am. I am. Down in the show notes, you'll find a link to the voice message system. Keep it short. Keep it clean so I can use it on the show. I would love to hear from you. You can also hit me up on Twitter and Instagram. I am C. Dorset on both. And you can find links to everything that I do over at projectshadow.com. If you've got a dollar, you can pass my way. In the show notes, you'll find a link for both my Patreon and community support. Thank you to everyone who helps out. It means the world, especially now. If you don't have any money right now or you don't feel like giving, that's perfectly all right. I really understand that, especially now. But if you know anybody you think would like any of the work I do, please share it with them. That helps out more than you know. Alrighty, well, that's it for us today. I hope everything's going well for you where you are. Stay safe, stay well, and... Don't forget to have the fun. Bye.